Ireland, of Ireland, with the British. Well, now, as I have been told this as a child, and I can't remember who told me, but it's something I feel I've always known. Our story is that uh, the irregulars were holed up in the four courts for three months. At the end of the three months, it became apparent that they would have to surrender. Initially, O'Connor, who was an engineer, his plan was to tunnel out under the Liffey and get his men out that way. But that turned out not to be feasible. So he wanted to go out with a bang rather than a whimper, and he planned a gesture of defiance, and that was the destruction of the Public Records Office. And my grandfather got wind of this plan, as did Owen McNeill. They were both Northern Catholics, they were both on the side of the Irregulars, but they were both historians and they both appreciated the value of the records in the Public Records Office. They were horrified. They, they went together down to the Four Courts under fire, I believe, and they pleaded with O'Connor not to blow up the Public Records Office. And their argument was that it was completely mistaken to believe that these were records which were solely concerned with the English, that these were actually records of the Irish people. So if they blew them up, what they would be doing would be destroying part of the history of their own people. They went away and a few days later, my grandfather was in the street on a beautiful sunny day and he heard a huge explosion. And he was so horrified, he burst into tears. And that was the only time he ever wept in public. So his reaction was absolute horror. And I think he was completely right. It was an extremely vandalistic and stupid thing to do. The destruction of an archive, however priceless, was probably a meaningless abstraction for those whose lives were being destroyed by civil war. That war left in its wake bitter pain and grief for the families and communities that were affected. Many simply buried this and never spoke about it, ever. My father was Richard Mulcahy. He was born in Waterford. His father was a post office official who became postmaster in Thurles and eventually in Ennis. They were typical of the Catholic middle classes, if you like, in the sense that they all supported Redmond and the Irish Parliamentary Party. They were all in favour of home rule. They were not in favour of separatism. I was born on the 13th of July, 1922. It was two weeks after the Four Courts uh, 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 event, and it was the same day if you look up the Irish Times of that day, Collins, who was head of the provisional government at the time, was called back to the army on the 13th of July, 1922, uh, as commander-in-chief, because being head of state, of course, uh, he had to be commander-in-chief. And he remained as commander-in-chief until he died uh, six weeks later. My grandfather, he didn't actually fight. His brother-in-law, Frank Ferrin, uh, did and indeed died during the Civil War. He died in uh, the car in Tintown camp and he died of pneumonia, in fact. And uh, the family were not permitted to visit him on his deathbed. And they never really recovered from that. He would only speak about the Civil War within the family uh, with uh, very close friends and then only in response to uh, questions. After the Civil War, he was a likely uh, subject uh, for an assassination like Kevin O'Higgins. But he, the extraordinary thing was that it, it never impinged on him as a person at all. He was always very relaxed, slept very well at night. He had never showed any stress. My wife, who was on the executive of Common Mountain, she spent a year in Kilmainham and she uh, was on hunger strike and uh, she and I, made every effort to keep that feeling away from our children. Extreme bitterness it left a lesion in my mind that I don't believe I've got over yet. But they also acted as a, a spur. No, it was a motivation in my uh, official life that we Republicans could do it better than those bastards. Yes. The Civil War divided the country. It contaminated political life. Sinn Féin split almost down the middle, with the pro-treaty faction ultimately forming Cumann and in 1923, and the anti-treaty faction becoming Fianna Fáil in 1926. 
But arguably, the biggest political casualty was the labour movement. One of Sinn Féin's slogans during the War of Independence was Labour Must Wait. There were determined attempts to neutralise its influence, which were only partly successful. Now the job was undertaken in earnest. In September 1922, the Irish Postal Workers' Union went on strike over the removal by the government of their cost of living bonus. The official response was swift. Police and the military were deployed to deal with the strikers. The episode left a bitter taste in the mouths of those in the labour movement. They had been co-opted into the national struggle on the back of a promise that it would bring a democratic socialist republic into being. So what was this? Class war? Was the government simply intent on stamping out insurgency wherever it arose? Postmaster General was J.J. Walsh. Walsh had previously been a trade unionist, and yet it seemed he had no qualms about the brutal put-down of the demonstrations that accompanied this dispute. How was this possible, that democratic socialist republicans were now suppressing workers' protests? But J.J. Walsh was a manifestation of a new reality. In post-Civil War Ireland, lines had been redrawn. Straying over those lines was extremely risky. It was dangerous to be dissident, as one hero of the War of Independence was to discover. Socialist Republican Liam Mellows, who was an opponent of the treaty, spent the last few months of his life in a prison cell. Before he was executed in December 1922, he wrote letters to fellow Republicans Austin Stack and Ernie O'Malley. The letters made it clear that he despaired of both government and the labour movement ever being capable of creating the kind of democratic socialist republic for which he was about to pay the ultimate price. The unemployment is acute. Starvation is facing thousands of people. The official labour movement has deserted the people. The Free State Government's attitude towards striking postal workers makes clear what its attitude towards workers generally will be. We declare that we desire our country to be ruled in accordance with the principles of liberty, equality and justice for all, which alone can secure permanence of government in the willing adhesion of the people. We affirm the duty of every man and woman to give allegiance and service to the Commonwealth and declare it is the duty of the nation to assure that every citizen shall have opportunity to spend his or her strength and faculties in the service of the people. In return for willing service, we, in the name of the Republic, declare the right of every citizen to an adequate share of the produce of the nation's labour. The Labour Party secured the adoption of it. I don't think anybody, practically speaking, bothered with it afterwards. It was regarded as some sort of a hoisting of a flag, but it wasn't uh, considered significant in the struggle that was commencing. But uh, let's not forget the circumstances of the country. Uh, we, were, uh, we were depending uh, entirely, right, well, we were depending really large, outside the cities almost entirely, upon the agriculture and rural vote. And you couldn't impose upon our society in those days uh, what, what one would describe as a uh, socialist or quasi-socialist policy. Cumling Oil Minister Kevin O'Higgins regarded the democratic programme as pie in the sky, and socialist pie at that. In a debate on cattle seizures in the Doyle, now moved to its permanent home in Leinster House, he said, we were the most conservative revolutionaries that ever put through a successful revolution. The pro-treaty government party, which was left running the country in the 1920s, now called itself Cumming Oil. Its members became identified in the public mind with the interests of property. Indeed, they were labelled men of property. This was the family home of William T. Cosgrave, the leader of the Common and Well government. In these surroundings, his children grew up in a household which boasted servants and ponies and all the trappings of wealth and privilege. These were middle-class governors and they faced no significant opposition in the Doyle. 
because Republicans refused to take their seats until 1927.